EJ, and I'd like to welcome all of our attendees tonight, and thank you for taking time out of your Friday night during the holiday season. In just a moment, I'll introduce our presenters, but first some housekeeping. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions during the presentations, and uh, one of our presenters, Dr. Maru, will be uh, looking for hands raised in the audience. Um, discussion may involve more than one presenter. Please use the raised hand symbol at the bottom of your screen, and they will recognize your questions. Also, introduce yourself to the audience and mention your publication or association if possible. I'd like to especially thank Suzanne Pittman and the staff of the American College of Dentists for their assistance in making tonight's program possible. Um, uh, next, I'd like to introduce our three presenters. Uh, Dr. Mike Maru is a private practice orthodontist in Thousand Oaks, California. He currently serves as a webinar editor for the Journal of Clinical Orthodontics and recently retired from his directorship of the Student Professionalism and Ethics Association. Dr. Dan Hammer is a U.S. Navy oral and maxillofacial surgeon with fellowship training in oral, head, and neck oncologic and reconstructive surgery. He's currently full-time faculty at the Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Residency at the Naval Medical Center San Diego, where he's director of the Division of Oral, Head, and Neck Oncology and Reconstructive Surgery and director of the uh, Naval Medical Center San Diego Facial Restorative Surgery Platform. And rounding out our stellar uh, lineup tonight is Dr. Donna Hurwitz, uh, who uh, has been in private practice for over 50 years, uh, uh, serves as a clinical instructor at University of California, San Francisco School of Dentistry for over 30 years, and has served as president of the San Francisco Dental Society, a trustee for the California Dental Association, and as an expert examiner for the California State Board of Dental Examiners. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to turn our program over to Dr. Maru. Thank you, Mike. Awesome. Well, first off, thanks for having us. And, you know, so Dan, Don, and I have been on the, uh, on the phone quite a bit and email the last few days. And, and I, I think we would all agree we have a very unique opportunity today. So we're going to take, we're going to have a little bit different of a format, uh, almost a discussion. Um, there's, there's a lot of trends right now in dentistry um, where, where practitioners, practitioners are accessing their information um, and, and, and the shift therein. And so what we're going to do uh, format wise, we're going to go through a series of questions and scenarios. Uh, each one of us are going to take an opportunity to respond. And then after, after we, the three of us have responded to whatever that question or scenario is, we'll take questions from the group. Um, it would be nice if we can address you know, each one of those individual questions as we hit them so that it, it, you know, it's, it's fresh in our minds. Um, and you know, if, if a certain discussion piece needs to be drawn out longer, we have the time to do it. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll move right along. So without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move in. Now, I, I don't know if you've seen the title. We've changed the title of the, this presentation just a little bit um, from what Dr. Chambers had initially anticipated. But what, what we're calling this is Dentist Expectations for Communication and Learning Within the Dental Profession. Last week, we talked a lot about social media and communication from doctor to patient. This is going to be from doctor to doctor and from doctor to expert within the profession. Where do we seek CE? Who do we see as experts? Things like that. Um, so the first two questions that we're going to pose, Dan, Don, and I are going to go through this. Um, but we just want to, we want to give you a little bit of you know, where we're coming from, what stage in our careers we're at, and, and where we seek information. So I'm going to pose this first. To you, Donna, Dan, you can take over right afterwards. I'll fi finish. But here are the two questions. Um, where do you personally turn for information and knowledge within the profession? And have you always accessed your information that way? Or have you seen a change in the way you've done it over you know, the past few years? So Donna, to you. OK, I'm up. I have definitely seen a change. And I should have seen it since my career has been very lengthy now. Uh, I will not be here and uh, dismiss the advantages now of 
face-to-face -face communication and a one-to-one -one, uh, environment. But I have followed most of my career traditional ways as most uh, baby boomers would have with following up lecturers, articles, authors of articles, and learning who has credentials, taking them up on offers. Uh, if I took a course to have a follow-up question with a clinical problem, uh, I would do the same thing with, uh, with articles. I kept up with my journals. So I did all of those things, but of course, over time, uh, as computers uh, made the scene in my life, things did change. And when I was when I was at at school at UCSF as a clinical uh, instructor, I started to learn more about this evidence based dentistry that uh, the ADA was uh, putting in the forefront as it always should have been. I started to learn more about statistics. I learned how difficult it is to research something. I'm a person who likes research. I actually like studying statistics, uh, but I was amazed at how difficult it was to get answers that you could depend on. Uh, as an example, in an EBD group we started at school, I had read an article uh, that it was beneficial to disinfect cavity preparations. And it made sense to me. So I did that and I was spending time, a few dollars doing this with uh, every operative case. But I was trying to look into as an example, am I spending my time wisely? Is the patient benefiting? I found that there was actually very few studies on that subject. And other things that I might have looked up, I found a plethora, really an overabundance of, of, uh, of research. And when I began to take courses on uh, statistics from people say like Michael Glick of ADA, who is my uh, hero in the, in the world on that. Uh, learning things that most studies have flaws. Today, after all I've done, I can frequently uh, pick apart errors in methodology, sometimes patient selection. I've even done some consulting with articles with ADA, even though I don't have a PhD or any uh, peer reviewed uh, credentials like that. And I began to see how difficult it was uh, to find out the truth. That's what we all want to do. That's what makes our profession and any profession uh, fun and satisfying, finding out the truth and acting in that direction. So I know things are difficult. I know we need something faster. I know there's frustrations. I never finished, figured out any answers other than to acknowledge that time is always limited. So you have to confine the time you spend on issues that really interest you, like that particular one interested me. Or, or when I go on uh, Medscape to keep up with medical information, I do their quizzes and I take their, uh, their uh, weekly information at their end of the year, mistakes we all made, don't do this anymore. I do all of that, but for something I need to spend uh, extraordinary amount of time, I will select something that affects my practice, my patients, or my body, or my loved ones. Uh, that's how I approach something. I have, I'm very interested in uh, Mike's uh, information on how the Facebook works. Frankly, I, I would see more positive about such an avenue than negative. That would just, that is just my uh, initial reaction. As long as the participants acknowledge 
credentials. That's really what you want. You want credentials of somebody who's giving you advice, somebody who has credentials and who is, who is experienced. And also uh, to take care that you have a uh, ability to follow up whatever is recommended. You know, to me, that's maybe the biggest risk uh, as opposed to a long uh, research project in which you have to go back and justify an, an outcome, whether there is one or not one or good, bad, whatever. Do you have that opportunity uh, in an approach like the uh, Facebook group? Uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Awesome. Th thank you. Uh... Mike and Richard for the introduction. Uh, great to see everybody um, have a, some comments. So the first question is, where do you personally turn for information? Uh, well, I'm gonna kind of do it in reverse order because this has changed significantly. And uh, so I've been in training for a very, very long time and I finally am done. And so I've had a huge change in where I go for information right now because I used to be part of structured education. Uh, had that be residency, had that be fellowship, had that be whatever. And I had mentors directly next to me who kind of shepherded me on where to go. So I was doing a lot more peer reviewed searches, um, et cetera. Now that I am not uh, in, in training, um, to be totally honest, I get most of my information right now from Instagram. Um, I'd say about 90% of it um in two forms and i think the reason why it's changed is when i was going through my dental education my residency my fellowship i needed to learn foundational knowledge i need to learn the evidence behind foundational knowledge and now that i'm done of course i need to make sure that foundational knowledge stays there but what interests me is the nuance um, you know, like was, that was previously mentioned, what can I learn from other surgeons and other people, uh, you know, with proper credentials that is going to enhance the outcome of my patient? That's really what I care about. Uh, so by going on Instagram, I can see a new technique being done in India by a surgeon and an outcome, and I can directly message them. I usually hear back from them within the same day on the other side of the world, and we're discussing cases. Um, you know, with, in a HIPAA compliant way, but, um, uh, you know, like that's what I need because what I think then is next week when I'm doing that case, using my foundational knowledge and traditional research, you know, methods, um, I, I can bring that to my patient. The other big change is the volume of information is just too much right now. Like even from when I was a resident, I graduated in 2017. That wasn't a long time ago from residency. The amount I expect my residents to know right now is absolutely insane, even from when I graduated four years ago. So I think it, just acknowledging the, the, the volume, and it's not that people don't want to invest the time, it's that there's truly not enough time to read what you probably should. Um, that's all we would be doing. And, and the last thing I want to talk about, why things have changed, man, patients have gotten smart and very, very well read. And I mean, about 70% of my practice is oncology and then the rest is reconstruction. And let me tell you, when I give a cancer diagnosis to somebody, that patient has already been on MD Anderson's website. They've already Googled the new NCCN guidelines. I mean, these people come armed. And I think there's a big difference now where they used to just come in and trust whatever the doctor says. And I think we're, patients have come now is trust but verify and it, I feel that every clinic I have or even when I'm doing the third molar eval and I have a, a, a mother of the child that I'm doing the consult for and I bring up do we have narcotics after third molars or not that is a huge huge thing and, and parents are coming in very armed on is my kid going to get opioids or not afterwards and what the evidence is behind that so um, I think that those are kind of the big three for me is the, the speed, the volume, and from a patient-doctor relationship, just the accountability to be up on your knowledge. And, and when patients ask me questions I don't know, that, then I know exactly where I'm going to go look that night. 
Um, and I just have the humility to say, you know what? I haven't read that article. I'll look at it and follow up on, you know, with you. So with that being said, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Mike. Awesome, thanks Dan and, and Don as well. So the only thing that I would add to that, cause I feel like, especially Dan, you and I are in a similar boat. The orthodontic world right now is using Facebook more than it is using Instagram. I would say the dental world as well as the pediatric dental world is doing the same. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But one thing that I wanted to say, a trend in my own life. So I graduated 2012 from residency. And what I, the, I would say my sources are still the same. Journal articles, when I say listservs, things that come from the, the, the ABO um, and other dental professional, um, either journals or, or publications. Um, and then Facebook. So it was the same back then, but what it, you, the, the order it used to be is I used to get the information first from a journal article, and then we would discuss it on social media. Now I feel like because the speed of information is so fast, I hear it on social media first, and then I try and verify its accuracy on social media or, or, or in the journals. Does that make sense? So before I used to get it in the journal and then work its way into social media, now it's completely reversed. And I hear that trends happening in a lot of places because it's immediate. I read something on Facebook. I'm like, wow, I really like the way that individual treated that case, or I like that new technology or, or whatever it might be. And then I go, and then I'm, and then I'm backtracking and say, okay, is there any data to support the, you know, me implementing this in my practice? Um, and that, and I, I would say that that's the trend of how it's changed for me. But what I want to do is I want to bring something about on the screen really quick. I'm going to share my screen with everybody. So bear with me here. Okay. Can everybody, there we go. Okay. Can everybody see this big flashy? Give me a thumbs up, Dan, Dan and Donna. Can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, yes. One of the things that's really interesting that's changed over the few years, I want to throw this example out there, and we're going to backtrack and talk about it probably throughout the rest of this hour, hour and 20 minutes that we're here on the phone or, or on this call. But one of the things that we're seeing is these Facebook and Instagram groups. Let me show you the one that's, that's most used within my fashion um, of orthodontics. So you can see here, Orthodontic Pearls, they have 8,000 members. And what's really neat, I, and I, I know a lot of you on this call are already using things like this. Dental Nachos is one of the big general dental ones. They have 36,000 members. Um, and you know, if you know, if you know Dental Town, uh, gosh, I want to say they have 300,000 people on Dental Town. I mean, these numbers are, they're starting to eclipse what organized dentistry is providing. I mean, just mass numbers of people. And what's interesting, and Dan mentioned this a minute ago, you know, we may, instead of having a conversation in you know within the U.S. and Canada, all of a sudden I'm having conversations with with orthodontists in Korea and in Australia and China and in different places, and we're seeing new techniques and things that I I don't know that I would have seen otherwise. So there's some positives, but let me show you what a day to day for me looks like. Is every single day I am on this Facebook page every single morning I check it. So this is I mean this is uploaded. This is live right now. Um, let's see when the last thing was posted. So somebody posted a case. If you look here, um, I'm going to circle it nine hours ago. This was posted, um, posted a case. I don't, I, I actually didn't read this one yet. Um, but within nine hours, if you look here, there are 45 comments talking about the case, giving thoughts and ideas, how to make it better, answering any questions they had within a nine hour period, 45 other orthodontists chimed in and gave information. Scroll down further. Um, this four hours ago, somebody had a question about this case right here. I haven't seen. Okay, so nine, you know, nine comments. Um, I know this individual. If we were just to look at what they asked, looking for some advice on treating this twelve-year-old boy. I won't go into the case, but they were looking for advice. Then you look down here in the comments. You can see me circling them. Um, I mean, individuals are then telling them how to treat the case. Things that used to take me days, if not weeks, to either search it out on PubMed, read the articles and try and find the information, or reach out to mentors, schedule a meeting, send over records and get advice is now happening in a matter of hours. If I have a huddle in the morning and I see a case is coming in that I have some questions about or I have an exam during the day, I can have, an answer, I can have several answers to my question within a matter of hours. So um, that coupled with, and, and I know Dan and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, this is happening in pediatric dentistry. You, you can see this, this head bar right here. 
MOPC. So this is this is the Orthodontic Pearls Group. MOPC stands for the the Mother of Pearls Conference. So they have started to hold their own conferences, and and they are selling out every single year. Um, you go, and it's it tends to be. I mean, we're still seeing experts lecturing at these things, which is fantastic, but it's a little bit more, I would say, hip. Um, there's a lot more going on. Everything from, you know, the, the, the lectures from, you know, delving into newer tech, things like that. Not only that, but how to run a business and then a lot more nightlife in these things. And it's really attracting, I would say, the, you know, the younger or the newer grads in the group. Um, so... With that setting the stage, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna go back to discussing this. Let me see if I can get off of there. Okay, so the question that I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out first to, to Donna and to Dan, um, are you seeing these same trends? I know, so Dan, you're, you, you know, you, you're OMFS, um, your wife is a pediatric dentist. Donna, you're a general dentist, is that correct? I know you guys are on mute. Are you seeing these same trends? I'm seeing it in orthodontics and in other places. Tell me what's going on in your worlds. No, I, I appreciate the, the question. So uh, OMFS has not really jumped on to the whole Facebook thing, uh, okay. it, but, but Instagram has exploded. Um, and okay. actually, if you look at our most recent journal, there's an article um, about uh, the influence of Instagram within oral maxillofacial surgery in the United States. Very similar to our plastic surgery colleagues who, has, who have been writing about this and actually doing good research on it for the past five years on patient education and outcomes with the increased social media presence. Because my, my profile on Instagram is 100% public. So mm -hmm. patients can see it. Everybody can see it. There, there are no rules. People have full access to everything that I post. Um, as far as pediatric dentistry, just speaking for Chrissy, uh, and we mentioned earlier, uh, she's really disappointed because this year she can't go to bourbon and baby teeth in Tennessee, which is the big pediatric dentist meeting now, instead of AAPD, um, it, as far as uh, continuing education. And you're right. The biggest reason I asked Chrissy before this talk, I said, obviously she goes to both, but I said, why do you want to go to this bourbon and baby teeth? And she said twofold. One, there's a huge focus on business and just like the business of dentistry and the business of pediatric dentistry. And it's not like a lecture style. It's like small case studies, people talking about their individual practices, how they dealt with staff, how they did with these things. You can do real time feedback and there's not like a set agenda. It's just like, and then it, there's also another thing called a mommy dentist group. They have their own meeting. It's tens of thousands of people that are part of it. They, and um, Chrissy really wants to go to meetings where there are other female, you know, mom, you know, dentists who are small business owners so they can talk in their own space uh, about the challenges of having, you know, kids being a small business owner and being a mom. And she, they, she feels a lot more of a home in those different situations. And I think the reason this is changing is Dan, just- Can I interrupt really quick? It. Let me throw yeah. this out. So, so has, has, has your wife or Chrissy mentioned, are, are these meetings, are, are, are they pulling in more people than the AAPD or the ADA meetings or kind of tell me? I, I don't, I don't think they're there yet. I mean, this is, you know, a, maybe a thousand people, uh, which is significant. It's, uh, but it's significant for sure. I, I don't, I don't think they're, but um, this last comment on this, um, I think we're seeing the change of the practice type, right? So, you know, and this is huge in OMFS. OMFS has been super resi resistant to DSOs and getting bought up by everybody. But the new trend in OMFS is sell your practice to private equity because nobody can afford your practice right now. And right. it is like wildfire in OMFS. Everybody is cashing in right now, their practices. Nobody's selling to new grads uh, yeah. because new grads can't afford it. So those days of having that one-on-one -on -one mentorship of the yeah. seller to the buyer, you know, dentist, no matter what the specialty is not happening. You're working for a DSO on your own. You got to go find your own CE and mentorship. Right. It's not built in anymore to the practice you're buying. So uh, I, I see uh, Richard has his hands up. So I'll pass it over to him. 
Uh, I was just listening to the three of you talk about, you know, the, the, the meetings and the origin of these meetings. And it, and it seems like the, the, the meetings coalesce, no, they're no longer around a professional organization or region of the country. They're, the common denominator here is that everyone in attendance is uh, uh, a member of the social media group. Am I right? A hundred percent. Donna, and, and it, sorry, oh, keep going, Dan. Oh, just to that point, that's another thing, because, you know, we, we'll talk more about organized dentistry later in this, but as a new grad, it is not easy to access the traditional channels of organized dentistry, especially in leadership. Yeah. I can go on a Facebook group and become like my wife, you know, super long history with ASDA, national leadership, everything, right? It's not as easy to get involved, you know, kind of when you get to a new area. She goes on Mommy Dennis Group. Now she's the head of San Diego for Mommy Dennis Group, coordinating 50 to 100, you know, mommy dentists to go do events. So I think that's that's true. It's not a geographic thing. It's it's the sh shared uh, bond. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to I'm going to go to Donna and then Richard will go to your question. So are you, what are you seeing, Donna? Yes, uh, a few things. Uh, first, I had no idea the trend had gone uh, quite uh, so exaggerated like you're, you're describing. That is amazing. Obviously, there is a, uh, a need for this. I did not do Instagram. I, I did uh, the precursor of that, I suppose, with some uh, chat rooms that uh, CDA had. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, it, it goes a long way toward your Facebook, uh, toward eliminating some of the biggest problems and trying to look up something like, like you were saying in a different order that you go from uh, some uh, generalizations and then how you can apply it to a specific case. Now you're, you're doing it the other way around. So you're introducing your own context right away. That's a tremendous advantage because uh, everything you do, everything we do, there's an element of uncertainty about it. Every case is different. Uh, so your, your context, um, is both the problem and the answer of what you're trying to achieve uh, most, most of the time. And so you're bringing the context in with you uh, and asking a, a wide uh, swath of uh, professionals uh, for their advice. It's, it is a faster way. And it's, mm -hmm. well, it's faster than... Uh, sometimes uh, the more uh, old fashioned traditional ways of having even uh, mounted models and, go, and going in person and then putting something uh, 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 going after certain individual characteristics of a given case are analyzed. Yeah. Uh, it's much more efficient. Uh, I still would like to know more about uh, follow-up, yeah. uh, what you do about that and, and how you, how you present cases as they develop. Do you do that as they go along? Are you making progress in the treatment? Uh, so all of those things are, are followed up in some type of a, a timed uh, sequence. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, would be the answer. And, and that's still, I mean, if I'm understanding correctly, and Dan, it seems like you were, you were gonna respond as well, but that it, it's still, it's still the onus is on the individual, the individual practitioner, um, but they're able to, to, to be guided at certain stages and they, they elect when that stage is. So if I need help at, you know, one phase of the treatment and not at the rest, I would only pose that question to the group then. Am I understanding that correctly or Dan, chime in? Well, I, I agree with you. And I think to, to further that is, some people choose to do follow up on the questions posed and and everything. Uh, some people do follow up with the primary references, uh, oh, you see. know, on what was done. Well, that's how I took it. So yeah, I mean, th there is follow up, but some people just take whatever information and then just run, <laughs> and, yep. and you don't you don't really hear anything more uh, from them. 
Well, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think that's going to be one of the risks or one of the challenges that we face as a profession, that if, if, if the source of the information is not, is not evidence-based, then where, where does the patient end up in the long run, right? I mean, that, that, I, I think that's going to be the key to the, t or that's going to be one of the takeaways here that, you know, I'm looking at, at a list of some of the, the, the strongest leaders in the profession on this, on this group. Like, that's, going to be our, that's going to be our call to action, I believe. Donna and then Richard. Uh, yes. Uh, now, how do you handle, you know, that old joke, uh, you show uh, seven dentists a case and you'll get eight different opinions, you know, surely you get a lot of different opinions. Well, well now you're uh, showing 8,000. Uh, this can't dentists. be a course on what you do with that, but just in, in general, how does that happen and, and how is that dealt with? <laughs> the we, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that off till a little bit later because we have a section on that. Um, but that's the biggest challenge is if you, so you said if you ask seven, you know, seven dentists, you're going to get seven different answers. But now what's happening is dental nachos or orthopreneurs or whatever it is, you ask 8,000 people that question. And like that girl had this morning, she had 45 responses in nine hours. So now, now she's got 45 to sift through. How do you know which one is evidence-based? How do you know which one's the best? All of that. I mean, I think that's the challenge. Richard, what were you going to say? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the senior citizens in this group tonight, <laughs> but uh, uh, a couple of questions. Are, are there, is there such a thing as influencers in these groups? And do some of the participants take on celebrity status? Absolutely. And just to show how crazy this has gotten, last week in Vegas was the DIA meeting. Has anybody heard of the DIA meeting? No. The Dental Influencers Association. And I'm not no even way. kidding. I am not even kidding. It was in <laughs> Vegas last week. Okay. And I have some buddies who went to it. One of them has 175,000 followers on Instagram bloody tooth guy. He's yeah. a, he's out, he's out in New Jersey. Uh, one of my dear friends is his name, his name is Vegas Max face and they, they have tens of thousands and they literally, it's a meeting now just for people on social media who are dentists to go meet other influencers to grow their followings and influence within a social media market. Now it could be Instagram. It could be what, you know, and they actually have like, courses and everything and they they uh invite influencers from other things so maybe from like the hotel world or from whatever to come speak about being dental influencers so that's uh that's can i ask you this dan do you feel like those dental influencers that 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 those you know when they post do the people reading it believe them more than they would your traditional experts because they're the influencer i mean I think the great question, the public believes them more. Got so if it. you put a post I put up and a post that Bloody Tooth Guy puts up with 175,000 followers, the public that look at his profile will believe everything he says over me because he has 175,000 followers. Interesting. But I, I, I don't think that's true professional to professional okay. because although I have much respect for Bloody Tooth Guy, he takes out teeth and takes a picture of his teeth the teeth and that's why he's famous okay yeah. we're like the circles i'm running in and the conversations i'm having we kind of look at blade tooth guy and it's like cool good for the profession get it out there but i'm not calling bloody tooth guy about a pathology case right so i think but the public definitely follows <laughs> thank you i'm gonna go dick and then lance <laughs> thank you uh so I'm listening to two specialists who I consider to be young. Thank no you. Offense, uh, <laughs> who know how to evaluate the validity of information. That's part of your training. Mm -hmm. Right. You have a foundation of knowledge that uh, allows you to apply the basic fundamentals. It allows you to evaluate the information that you're pulling off social media. When I talk to young dentists, general dentists, they tell me they have not been taught those skills in dental school. Right. So they're getting their information from social media and they're choosing 
the sites that have the most followers. I worry that they don't have the ability to discriminate. So they're gonna, they're not gonna listen to Dan Hammer. I don't think, I think they're gonna listen to the influencer with the most followers. Your comments, please. I, I'm gonna, I, I, I saw Dan nodding his head. I, I, I am seeing the same trends. Remember, so I just left SPIA a few weeks ago. And so I've been working hand in hand with students for, you know, for more than 10 years. And, and I was a student prior to that. So I would agree with that. I actually, I, I, Jerry, I see your hand up and I'm going to come to that. I, Dick, and, I, I, and I'm not losing what you said because we're, we're circling back here. Um, Lance, I, I, I'm going to take your question, but I want to ask you a question as well. So for, I, I'm sure everybody on here knows Lance Rucker, but you're in, in, you're in, in BC, you're in Canada. Are you seeing these same things happening in Canada as we're seeing in the U.S.? What would you think, Mike? I would assume yes. Yes, I, 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 you assume correctly. Okay. Uh, I would like to say that at least the, uh, several institutions in this regency that I have dealt closely with and, uh, and across the continent uh, do include materials that attempt to uh, help students uh, qualify um, material that is evidence-based. Right. That being said, I'll go back to Dick's question because I think it's it's the appropriate question, and I'm um, probably even more concerned than Dick is about it. Can I can I interrupt? So I, Becca, will you pull up your screen for me? We have the outgoing president of the Student Professionalism and Ethics Association with us today, and I just texted her. You can see her down here. Um, and I and I and I posed her this question. I asked if she'd be willing to address it. I mean, can can you answer Dick's question? I mean, what do you? She's she's at USC in Southern California, and I mean, I know you've been all over the country with SPIA. What what do you see? Well, this is actually really funny listening to this conversation because Facebook in our generation is kind of obsolete. There's no one really on Facebook, but Instagram, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen something on Instagram and I'm like, wow, I didn't know you could do it like that. And then I'll text either you or Eric and say, have you ever done an injection like this? And Eric's like, oh God, please don't ever do that. So I'm lucky that I have, sorry about that. Um, I'm lucky that I have uh, mentors that are able to kind of help me through that. But I would say that most of my class is not that lucky. Um, I also would agree that if somebody has more followers, more students will tend to listen to whatever they're saying. Most of us can usually tell by their work when you look at it and you're like, those are the ugliest veneers I've ever seen. And so we kind of like, okay, right. their work isn't legit, but sometimes we will see things and I don't know whether it's right or not. So if a patient were to ask me something, I would go to PubMed, but if I was just trying to look and see what's the most current, usually Instagram. So, so that's you, but what about, so are you, but when it comes to your classmates, are you agreeing with Dick's concern that the majority of your classmates might be looking elsewhere other than the literature? The first, my first response to that is yes, I do think that. But when I, when I dive a little deeper, the majority of my class, I would think no. When a patient were to ask them questions, they would dive into the literature, absolutely. Um, but there would be a few, obviously, minorities in that group that would tell them whatever, but that they would have been done that anyway. So I do still think that relevant literature is still popular amongst most of us. Good. Hopefully it stays that way. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Jerry, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move to you. Well, thank you, doctors. I'm Jerry Savory and I'm just an old broken down cowboy dentist uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I'm thankful that I'm retired. I still have the fire. Uh, just a couple comments that I've been listening to, especially with uh, Dr. Hammer uh, about the uh, just tidal wave of information. This is a, a brief quote from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Denson, who's I think an internist at the University of Iowa, says it is estimated that a doubling time of medical knowledge in 1950 was 50 years. In 1980, seven years. In 2010, 3.5. In 2020, it is projected to be 0.2 years just 73 days, St students who begin medical school in the autumn of uh, 2010 will experience approximately three doublings in knowledge by the time 
They complete the minimum length of training, which is seven years needed to practice medicine. Students who graduated in 2020 will experience four doublings in knowledge. What is learned in the first three years of medical school will just, will just be 6% of what is known at the end of a decade from 2010 to 2020. So knowledge is expanding faster than our ability to assimilate it. And the reason I say that is um, I've generally been considered the zenith of hallucinatory reasoning, but I noticed that uh, when, when I was taught how to review the literature, it was, it was eye-opening to me and about 2% of the literature could be known as quality literature. What I'm wondering, especially in the town that I'm in, is what role will AI play in filtering down all of this? And, and uh, Dr. Rucker knows uh, a new uh, uh, Dr. Coburn, who was uh, a champion of uh, ergonomics back in the day. And he said to me one time, at any moment in time, there's probably one way that's the best way of doing anything. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, the digital age has provided all this wonderful diagnostic. I just wonder if it will also apply, and I anticipate it will apply to this volume of knowledge that we're trying to assimilate into our heads and somehow, you know, uh, generate into the truth that could even be involved in, a, in the uh, political system that we're currently operating under. <laughs> so anyway, those are just my thoughts. Well, first off, thank you. Uh, Donna, I'll, I'll let you answer and then I'll come back to me. Uh, just a remark about the speed from uh, Jerry. We know there's a number of things, beliefs, treatments, and so forth that have been done through the years that have been since discredited. We don't do them anymore. And yet, once they take hold in society, or even something that's not particularly uh, old, but it begins with a, a short, usually sensational newspaper or a television blurb about something and it takes hold in the general population where if, if it's not discredited quickly, it, it takes a, a place in the ethos of the culture and it's uh, almost impossible to get rid of it. Now, if we want to talk about the disadvantage of trying to cope uh, with so much material and the, the speed uh, rate, like, like we're all, you're all on a racetrack nowadays. Uh, could it ever be said that this same speed could be turned into an advantage in which if some technique is proposed and say an, a fair amount of people try it, <laughs> It, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't, it does not uh, work, it, does not be, uh, it is not proven uh, a good approach. Uh, could it be that that could also be an advantage that the word uh, gets around and, and we don't have uh, techniques recommended for uh, vast uh, swaths of dentists who continue do so doing something uh, that does not benefit their patients? That, that's a very good point you bring up. I, I mean, because because the positivity or negativity, I mean, it, it goes in both directions. Um, and I think as long as we, I, I think I think our responsibility. I think again, the takeaway is going to end up being, if I were to guess, what the takeaway at the end of this this discussion is, is that we as the leadership of this profession need to guide that. We need to empower the individuals who are taking in this information to do exactly what you said. Take the positive out of it. Learn it. Learn the proper way. To, to, to disregard the misinformation. And, and I, think, I think it'll only benefit. One thing that I wanted to say, Jerry, I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, there's a couple of different dental companies that have popped up recently. Kyle Stanley out of USC in Southern California um, started Dental AI, which is a diagnostic, um, which is a, it's a diagnostic tool and it's all, um, yeah, it's all AI. It's, it's pretty interesting. I, I'm not going to delve into it. I also want to show the group. I'm going to share my screen um, for just a moment here. I, um, let's see if I can get this. Can everybody see this article right here? This was, I, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I had it on my screen. It was in preparation for this meeting. Um, the physician's experience of changing clinical, ex clinical practice, a struggle to unlearn. Going back to what you said, Jerry, how, 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 how the body of knowledge is changing so rapidly. How do we unlearn the things from 10 years ago that have now been replaced? Because, you know, I, 
you know, I, I just joined. So I purchased a practice, a little bit of my history. I purchased a practice um, two years ago in my hometown. And there was a I, I, the practitioner that I took over for who was going to stay on for quite a while. COVID changed that. But graduated in 1982. Fantastic clinician, wonderful human being. But a lot of the techniques that he was still using were from 1982. Th th this struggle to unlearn, I think, is going to. I think it's going to be compounded in the future with the rapid with the rapid turnover of information. That's. I mean, I don't need to say anything more there. I just wanted to share that article in case anybody was curious later. Dan, chime in. Yeah, yeah. Just as far as AI, I, I great question. Um, my response is depends what algorithm is controlling the 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 narrative. Yeah. Because that's the problem with AI, especially when you look at the social media. And if anybody wants to get freaked out about social media, if you haven't yet, watch the Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma. It is mm -hmm. absolutely terrifying, yet I'm still on it. So what does that say about the world we live in, right? Uh, but I, I don't put as many pictures of a, uh, my, my family, but they're still out there and somebody owns them. Well, can uh, I ask because, you? Keep going. Because it, my, my thing with the AI, it's, if you look at social media and, and I'm not, I, there's other with the applications for AI, but social media, their goal has nothing to do with the words you're putting out. Their only goal is that you stay on that platform for as many minutes a day as possible. Mm -hmm. And they, they know you so well that they can send you notifications of things going on on their platform to bring you back on. So I, I think that's my thing. And that's always economics. That, that's dollars and cents. That's a business. So um, that's kind of terrifying to me. For, for the question with General Dennis and being able to decipher, um, as we heard from, you know, our, the current student, I mean, I think they still have the skill set. But I'm, if I have seen anything, especially in large metropolitan areas where it's really complex and competitive in dentistry, new practitioners do not have mentors to reach out to. Yeah, they do not have mentors like they used to. They're not getting involved with organized dentistry as much. They're not finding that local dentist, you know, who's three, three streets over, who's uh, taking them under their wing and they're finding new routes. So that I think that's really the big thing. I don't think it's that they don't want to engage. I think they're just finding their own mentors and, and, and their own information. So I think oh, it's a tough it. world to find that right now it, because the traditional means are changing. But let me do this. I'm going to move this discussion along just a little bit, and I'm going to skip a couple of questions. Donna, I'm going to I'm going to come to you. Question number three that we have down on our agenda. Um, so we we've talked a lot about these trends. We've talked a lot about where this information is coming from, but the impact on social media group information and collaboration does this trend does it positively or negatively affect the profession? And how does the average practitioner filter out this in misinformation and find which ones are correct? I mean, what are your thoughts there? Am I on? You are. Uh, well, we already touched like you were uh, 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 implying somewhat on this. Yeah. Uh, again, the, the universal uh, justification would be the, the credentials of whoever is, is advising. And uh, that has much to do with their education, but also their character and their person, their personality. Mm -hmm. uh, how to filter all of this? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? That's why we're here. We're, uh, we're at really investigators. You know, if you were a uh, uh, a crime investigator, generally you need uh, three people. You cannot just take one person. Uh, it needs to be verified by somebody else. And generally you require three people, three people to be able to uh, say something is, uh, is proven and something has, uh, you need some evidence of longevity and some ways of verifying. Uh, the other, the disadvantage, you could have some fragmentation of the profession in which we are not all necessarily guided into what the standing uh, standard of care is. Uh, you start doing things in uh, 
too many uh, different different methods. It could it could lead to some problems uh, even in analyzing the results. But I you know I would leave that to the uh, the uh, specialists. So mainly uh, I I'm saying things should be tracked, mm -hmm. and I'd also like some ideas we should have about how we're going to do future standards of care. Standard of care generally came from the profession. It came from CDA and then the state board uses it and so forth. But now we have, uh, how are we going to have a good way, a beneficial, a scientific humanitarian way even of, of changing with uh, ethical and legal risks and working into our uh, science. Uh, the speed, uh, so we're, we're affected not by our own desire for speed and our research and our treatment, but we're also influenced by, by the general population, people. People are in a hurry. Everybody's in a hurry today. So you're, you're, you're uh, impetus can be uh, too much trying to do something uh, faster that might not uh, hold up that well. Uh, all, of the, all of these things I, I think are, are more problematic in the future because of the speed and, and the ease. Things that are easy might not be the best approach to actually solve a problem for the patient. Uh, those, those were my uh, uh, remarks about the, uh, my, the reason I felt it certainly is a net positive, but it also opens up some decision-making, uh, including, including standard of care and, uh, and uh, ethics and legal, legal risks. Uh, all of these things we have, you have to, have to uh, take into account with your clinical decisions. You make a very good point. Dan, you had something to say. Yeah, no, th those are fantastic points. When it comes to standard of care, kind of because of my weird cross training, I do a lot of litigation reviews as like a subject expert. And, you know, in the end of the day, we can talk about all this social media and what's going on in the profession. But when it comes to standard of care, improving standard of care, I will tell you in every case I've ever been an expert on, it always goes back to the governing documents of an association or profession. So like in oral maxillofacial surgery, we have our parameters of care. They are written by a group of experts by the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons. And although we say it's not the standard of care kind of workbook, it kind of is. And that's what either will put the noose around our neck or save us from litigation, you know, in the future. So I think there's still a lot of respect, especially from like the legal system, and from like a purely like litigation into organized dentistry, ADA guidelines. Um, once again, just being married to a pediatric dentist. I mean, the AAPD guidelines are kind of like scripture <laughs> to okay. the pediatric dentist. And, and they really, everything they do falls under those AAPD guidelines that they've memorized since they were residents. And the AAPD does such a good job sending out the new version every couple of years to recalibrate the entire specialty. Um, so I think there still is a lot of that for standard of care, but I agree with you 100%, Donna, that it makes it very difficult to track. And that's where the difficult is, is like how much are we deviating from normal and are we still within the, the confines? So it, it's a good challenge. Re really quick, I'm gonna respond to that, then I'm gonna go to Richard and then Dick. So Dan, something that's interesting there to keep the conversation going. So I think that's amazing that AAPD does that. Orthodontists do not. Only 40% of orthodontists are board certified. Um, that's one set of standards. And then you have the other set that's just simply defined by standard of care. And what is the standard of care? It's what the average practitioner would do in a specific situation. Where it's being called into question, and I don't know if it's happened in dentistry as much, but where it's happening in orthodontics a lot is now we have Smile Direct Club, we have Candid, we have Bite, we have all of these groups coming in. And what's happening is, You've got, the, you've got these, these other groups moving into the orthodontic space. And so if we allow the standard of care to be lowered, if we're not sticking to that, that, that high standard that was established by the profession previously, if we lower that, then it makes it so much easier for these DIY groups to come in. So orthodontists, I think we're seeing it that hurt us a lot more. I, I, 
you know, and I haven't seen it permeate other parts of the profession yet, but that's not to say that it won't come, you know? And so I think it's something that we need to be aware of, alert, you know, alerted to. And, and honestly, that format that you just gave, what a great roadmap. What if the profession did actually write standards? And orthodontists don't have that, period. We could, but we don't. Um, okay, Richard, sorry. Uh, I, I think this goes back to an earlier co comment, but I had a question for Mike, Donna, and Rebecca. And I wanted to know, currently, do, do schools teach um, critical thinking and how to review literature? I'm going to defer to, to Becca on this one because you're in school. You're a senior. Are you still there? Oh, you're driving. Don't die. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me, though? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm, saying I'm, I'm on the... I'm on the 60. We're pretty dead stop right now. No worries. Um, <laughs> We're worried. <actually>, yes. <laughs> at least in uh, at USD, we do the PBL, the problem-based learning method, as far as reviewing literature and all that. And the whole point of that is to be able to critically think about what you're looking into and why you're using that resource and is it valid and what information are you getting from that and what, you know what I mean? Like, how are you approaching the information? And I think that's the whole point of the system. Thank you. One of the challenges, Richard, that I think that we have is I, so, and, and when I was president of the American Student Dental Association, and then shortly thereafter, when I worked as a consultant with them for a few years, I traveled to a lot of dental schools. I don't know how many I hit, but, you know, it, it, probably half of them at some point in time here or there. And, and what I would say is, is I believe that each university is teaching critical thinking, but is it going in one ear and out the other? I don't know. I think there are so many stresses in dental school, whether it be boards or whether it be, you know, passing your clinical exams, whatever it is, I think what's happening is students, and, and, and honestly, I did the same as a student, but you're looking for what's the quickest way to receive the information, get a decent score and move to the next, whatever it is. And so I don't know that the, I, I sometimes worry that the critical thinking piece is being, taught but missed because access to other information is so immediate and easy you know i remember in dental school i had to go you know, i was down in the library digging up in the old files trying to find journal articles that somebody told me they thought it was from you know 1998 and in, in you know volume six and i'm digging for it and it was wrong it was in four but it took me three days to find it you know i it, that that has changed so much and so I, I think it's being taught but i wonder if it's being missed by some Dan, would you agree with that, or wh where do you stand? Uh, just real quick, uh, and then I see Rebecca has her hand up. I critical thinking, I mean, is so complex and so yeah. difficult, and mm -hmm. is a lifelong thing to study. I, I'm in the Naval Postgraduate War College right now, and we have a semester on critical thinking for intermediate leadership in the U.S. Navy. And it is by far the biggest deep dive. So, you know, I think in dental school, they can have it through PBL, they can have it through whatever, but like, that's like the starting point. And your everyday practice is how you gain that critical thinking skill. And man, I, I'm still working every day to become a better critical thinker. Um, so th that's kind of my, my thought on critical thinking. I think it needs to be part of the hidden curriculum of dental school, the hidden curriculum of residency. Yeah. I, I was just taken out of submandibular gland with my resident, okay? The whole time I'm teaching him how to be a surgeon, but I have a whole nother curriculum that I'm teaching him on how to be a surgeon, how to be um, a teammate, how to be a collaborator with the staff, how to make critical decisions on what to clip, how, what not to clip. So mm -hmm. I think it's a lifelong uh, tool. Thank you, Dan. Quick response from Becca, then Dick, it's over to you. So just chime in after her. I was just about to say, I think it was pretty naive of me to say that, that yes, we're doing critical thinking. I think like Dan was just saying, um, critical thinking is also a maturity thing. Um, over time, as you mature as an adult, you also understand why you do things and how you critically think through things and responses and everything. Um, so I think that they give you the, the toolbox to be able to use it later on in life, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to utilize it in every situation as a student. Right. Thank you. Perfect. So, Dick, over to you. Well, real quick comment on critical thinking. My son-in-law's twin 
graduated from Indiana, I guess it's two and a half years ago now. He was 12th in his class, so good student. And I asked him that very question. And he goes, hmm, no, they didn't teach it to us. <laughs> but I, I really put my hand up to agree with Dan about standard of care. And I come from two, av two places. Uh, ADA, for some reason, has avoided standard of care. But in the late 90s, when we started seeing these large group practices, they're getting freaked out. They're thinking, we've got to do something to control the environment. That's when we start doing parameters of care. And I was on the committee with the prosthodontist that wrote our parameters of care. I thought all the specialty groups wrote parameters of care. The other angle I come from is I was Indiana's chair of peer review for 30 years until three years ago. Mm -hmm. And standard of care is defined by, first of all, any official position, which is what the parameter of care is, a, a, an official position. Then the next level would be um, peer reviewed literature. And the next level would be what's taught in schools predominantly. And if you can't find any other official source, then you look at what the peers would be doing in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. So, and, and remember, no matter what we think is professionalism or ethical or proper, eventually it all goes back to what the courts are gonna do. And I think the courts are always going to go back to official information, the parameters of care. If the ADA has a standard about taking radiographs or what's in peer reviewed literature, I think we might be protected with standard of care. Great I'm points. Done. Over. Thank you. That was awesome. Lance. Yeah, I am uh, uh, only uh, on guard, and I suppose most of the people on this call are as well that um, the standard of care uh, sometimes is usurped, even in courts, by um, frequency of care, by usual practice. And that may be dominated with the same sort of let's check online to see who's doing what and how many are doing what. So mm -hmm. uh, mentorship being substituted with, to a certain degree, as you've described it, with social media linkage, um, and information to recent graduates certainly proliferates as to how, how to get more information, but I'm concerned that it's not about how to get more reliable information. Um, the, I'm certainly confident that you on this call are, are carefully digest the information that you use as a basis for your decisions about interventions, or sometimes more important about not intervening. Um, right. But misinformation certainly proliferates at least as rapidly as reliable information. And that's always been the case, but when it does it in the dimensions that we're talking about now, it gets really spooky really fast. And certainly as a patient, I have to ask, do I want care that's the most reliable at the moment and under, with the conditions that are known now about me and about situations and about relevant and appropriate treatments, or do I want what's most trendy? And my heavens, I certainly would think most patients would elect the former. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lance. Donna. Uh, yes, at UCSF, yes, uh, we, we do teach uh, evidence-based dentistry and so forth. Uh, the students have uh, exercises, particular uh, cases to criticize on uh, studies and so forth. Uh, some schools are better than others, so some schools even have, uh, I think in Buffalo, they would have a librarian, yes, a librarian come on the clinic floor, uh, see what the students are doing, and give them an idea of what on that particular procedure, what they could talk out, and go look up and verify uh, in a, a research study. Uh, obviously, one of your uh, dilemmas at school, uh, students have nowadays uh, an aversion for a great deal of reading, shall we say, and they, they, might, uh, they might not enjoy uh, trying to look up long uh, research articles before they really have the uh, expertise to be able to determine flaws in the study itself. Uh, which is always uh, the hardest part uh, for me. Um, plus, of course, they have their uh, full, full 
full curriculum that uh, maybe some on the faculty are not eager to have questioned, and yet those are the very things uh, that are most relevant for the student to uh, determine if they have a, a <laughs> if they have a bone to pick with that. That might be the most interesting for them, uh, rather than some of the more uh, hypothetical uh, exercises that they get. Uh, but uh, they are they are taught how to look up things in the uh, PICO format and so forth. So I hope uh, we can only hope they put it to good use. Thank you. So. Let, let me pose this. I'm going to start the question out to Dan, but I, you know, then to Donna and the whole group. What is our role? You know, looking at this screen right here, we've got educators, we've got publishers, we've got past you know leaders of dental organizations. We've got the president of the American College of Dentists. We've got a really, you know, kind of diverse group in leadership in dentistry. What is our role, if any, in in helping to guide this, mitigate whatever it might be? Dan, start us off. You know, I, I think this is a huge, huge question because we all are leaders on this call. Um, but I think that you don't always have to lead from the front. And it, I don't think this is something that organized dentistry is ever going to control. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, so I think we just need to forget about that. This is its own world. It, 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 the ADA says stop doing this or doing that. Um, it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so like, we're, this isn't like, you know, school children being told what to do. It's how do we embrace it? So what I think organized dentistry needs to do is we need um, to move out of, you know, one of the things that Richard asked or stated that was so awesome. And I've never thought about it, but it's totally true is man, we are moving away from geographic existence when it comes to organized dentistry and things. Yeah. Geography doesn't really matter that much other than local. I will say local matters because that's your mm -hmm. ecosystem and that's what how you, you know, you make your living and you provide for your family and you need to have that local level. Um, but, but really it, it's, it, it's interest. So maybe as organized dentistry, that's where we need to go and start looking at our org structures and start looking at our you know, communication strategies and think of it more as a special interest group, kind of like subset rather than you're from Florida and you're from New York. And I, I think that would be a huge, huge step forward. I know Amos is struggling with this. Um, you know, I'm now working a lot with our international association, which has been extremely enlightening because when you're working on a global level, social media is the most economic way to communicate. Mm -hmm. When you look at like tr truly like how much it costs to get to a number of people, there's nothing cheaper, especially if you're promoting something. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of my thought on organized dentistry. It's, it's just morphing and being flexible and adapting. And instead of trying to control, because you know, like was mentioned, standard of care, those things are going to be protected. There, I, I really don't think this is going to change anything there, but as far as um, not having bourbon and baby teeth be bigger than the APD <laughs> one day, I think they need to adapt. Thank you, Dan. Um, let's go to Donna and then Lance, if that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm cool. I'll, I'll, I'll ju just say uh, that we all need to be concerned with failures because you can learn uh, as much for failures as some of your uh, successes. And uh, how, how any group, uh, Facebook book or others, uh, teaches you uh, from failures is a, is a mark of not just integrity, but uh, their, their, uh, uh, their, ex their expertise. Uh, things happen and uh, sharing your failures uh, is, very, is very critical if that is done uh, in this uh, avenue. Thank you, Lance. Yes, I, I was uh, actually quite surprised, uh, Mike, by your comment that uh, orthodontics does not seem to have a central repository of standards of care. That I, I'm shocked. And, and, and please don't see that as a downer. It's just a surprise. Don't. It's a surprise. Yeah. And if that isn't there as a, an anchor somewhere, then I am seriously concerned that you are very vulnerable. Uh, as are. a specialty, um, regardless of whether it's uh, people that are fully trained, qualified, and certified, or people that have jumped in 
in the various ways that one can do that by restricting practice or not even bothering to restrict practice. Um, but I think uh, organized dentistry, if anything, does need to monitor uh, a, as a group that standards of practice are continually reviewed uh, and, and continually declared uh, in light of emerging popularized techniques. Certainly, uh, that has to be part of uh, the reflection by which we look at these things. But I suppose I would like to see a, some sort of, uh, if, you, if you will, Snopes type resource <laughs> that evaluates social media groups, uh, ongoing evaluation for reliability and authenticity um, by uh, some sort of indexing that could serve as a uh, as a coaching uh, anchorage, uh, uh, a coaching matrix for uh, dentists, rather than what they what we find uh, are, and they usually have reported that is used, which is popularity. Right. If it's straight popularity, then I'm I'm worried again. The, these are worries that you have to understand in context, but, uh, but I, I am concerned. It's a serious concern. And unfortunately, uh, there are trends in that direction. And uh, we saw those multiplied astronomically uh, um, um, and tremendously, not even in our own domain, but in the political domain in the last US election. You know, you, <laughs> look around. Are we talking about numbers? Are we talking about right or wrong? Are we talking about money? Are we talking about, you know, uh, uh, how information proliferates as reliable versus unreliable? And again, I think that, that there's, if anything, the curve strongly favors unreliable information. If it happens to agree with what you really thought all along or would like to think, well, then that probably gets more credit. And we know that's not correct. You all know that's not correct, but it's still a risk. And for new clinicians, it's got to be when they're out there and they're exposed day to day with their patients, um, it's got to be scary to think that they might be relying on someone that only has 3000 uh, uh, users versus someone that has 300,000, despite the fact that your 3,000 uh, uh, user group or attendee group is much more uh, credible and, and reliable and authentic. And, and so I think some sort of index there could be very helpful. It'll be a non-ending task, but it seems a worthwhile task. Just for a thought, and I'd, I'd appreciate your responses to that. Thank you. I'm going to respond to it. Then, then Richard, we're going to go to you um, really quick. And what so about the orthodontic piece, we have had a standard of care in the past, right? When you look at, I mean, class one, your, your occlusion works, you, all, all of that type, that's there. But I think technology had advanced faster in orthodontics than it did in some of the other specialties. You know, sure, Seric machines came out to, to build a crown, but it was still a crown. Braces went away. Clear aligners came in, a completely different modality of treatment, and standards were never set for that. TADs came in, mini implants came in, standards weren't set for that. And so I don't think the orthodontic, so the orthodontic pro profession did have that baseline, but I don't think we've kept up at setting what the standard is for those other things. And that's where these newer groups, the, the Smile Direct Clubs of the world have moved in because we on our end didn't do a good enough job of setting that. that and that's all I meant, Lance. Yeah, but if Richard, you, if you, yeah. if you, if I may, if you set that uh, and you set standards and they, uh, and they appear to um, exclude uh, certain portions of some of the contenders that you have named, um, Aren't you fully expecting that it will be seen as an economic defense position rather Absolutely. than as, as something which recognizes uh, credibility and yeah. evidence spacing? And, and, and I don't, there's probably no on. way to avoid that. Probably no way to avoid it, but it, seems, but it has to be uh, considered. Agreed. Good and great point, Richard. Um, just gonna follow up on, on Lance's question. Um, you know, are there any uh, media site, sites or formats out there that are just plain evil? Um, you know, um, <laughs> I think you know, I, wrote, I wrote an editorial a while back about Napster. And Napster, when this is 20 years ago, when it came out, I mean, they had right. 80, million, 80 million followers. 
and but they 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 made their living by stealing people's livelihood and they finally got put out of business by the court so my, my question is there are there any uh, dental napsters out there not to, that I'm aware of, Dan. Are you aware of any? To my knowledge, and I think that's why it's grown so quickly. Although the evaluating, you know, evidence base, and I love the idea of a score and a, like a some reliability measure. I, I don't know who would lead the charge on that because, as it was mentioned, it's a, that would literally be a never-ending task. Uh, you know, trying to get that that together. <laughs> but I haven't seen any evil Napsters in the space, and I think. It's actually, you're, you're talking about the generation on Instagram that is the most, although they, if you look at the Gen Z data, it's going to say that they're the most isolated generation, you know, fee, as far as feeling, but they actually are the most connected generation there's ever been. And, and so I think all of us want to be part of something. All of us want to connect with people. And I think that's why it's been an overall positive experience. You don't see evil Napsters everywhere because when I talk to people on these platforms, like people care, like they mm -hmm. really want to talk about cases. They really want to be better clinicians. They really want to do the right thing. I, I've never seen anything contrary to that. Maybe I'm naive, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> and, and I would agree with that, Dan, wholeheartedly. And, and though I, I have seen advice given that I, I would find to be incorrect when it comes to evidence-based dentistry, I just don't think it was given maliciously. Does that make sense? That they were trying to help, though they might not have had the best information. And, I, and, and going back, I, I think that's, I mean, that's the only challenge. But no, I don't think any of it's been malicious. Like Napster was malicious. Um, but I, I don't think that is. Something that's been on my mind, Jerry, I'm going to call you out. Is that okay? Oh, let me go to Donna and then I'm going to ask you a question, Jerry, if that's okay. Uh, I had a comment that's uh, quite a, a intriguing idea or problem uh, raised by Lance about uh, classifying the uh, quality of these groups. Certainly there, it would not be uh, easy to determine who is going to classify them because if you're maybe a little uh, outside an old, an old or maybe some, out, some, some factors of outmoded standard of care, then you might not be able to get a classification. Uh, so you might uh, consider some other ways such as longevity, uh, how long the participants stay with the group, meaning they're satisfied, they, they, uh, they are enriched, some type of a self-classification like that. Uh, now, I, none of us know if that would pass muster, say, in front of a judge with a uh, malpractice case or something. You know, judges are usually uncomfortable with uh, scientific and medical issues uh, anyway. But it, it would be good. Uh, to uh, for the for the group to think of uh, some some way uh, to give 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 yourself some uh, specific credentials that way. Th those so, would be my, so my own response. This, first off, yeah, thank you. This is what I was going to post to you, Jerry. I think ties in with all of this. Going back to what you said a few minutes ago. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw this out there and tell me if this is what you were thinking, because I haven't been able to get over when you started talking about AI. And I think maybe I took it in the wrong direction. As, after you said that, what's been in my mind is, and, and tell me if you're meaning this, if, if we had an artificial intelligence entity or, or software program that looked at these questions that were posed on these social media sites and that then could recommend or give you evidence-based information, that it could tie in, that it would automatically, like if somebody posed a question on second molar endo, I don't know. And then it would pull out articles that are legit and insert it. Is that what you were referring to? I yeah, I, I mean, if you think now, like with JPD or any of the, the, the scientific uh, echelons of investigation, um, you know, that there, there is this, this distillation Somebody has to do the distillation uh, in order to come to a conclusion. And because of the sheer volume of information, 
you know, Ernest Hemingway said, we all have a built-in crap detector. And uh, so they're given the human brain as it currently exists, that AI could be of assistance to us in developing, well, your standard of care for that, for that matter. Uh, and it would be an acquiescence on the part of our humanity to allow a machine to do that, but we're allowing machines to do other things. I mean, the only, for the longest period of time in my practice, the only thing I ever had was a digital hydrocolloid machine. And you probably don't even know what hydrocolloid is. <laughs> so, so, I just started Googling it. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm just thinking that, um, you know, given uh, how we try to progress as a society and it, like, like someone said earlier, this goes well beyond uh, dentistry. It goes into our political system. Uh, we're currently facing that, it, you know, it could change the way we all view democracy because of the, the way we can be influenced. And uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've right. never restored, the, the creator has not shared one bit of the design specifications with me on any of this. So I'm left to speculate a lot, but uh, I like to speculate with other people that know more than I do, so. Wow, thank you. I, I, I'm glad you clarified that because I, I think it's a fabulous idea. I have two close friends who own artificial intelligence companies and I wasn't, I, I wasn't hot on the idea of it until they showed me what they were doing and then it completely changed my perspective and not how it took over what humans did, but how it, how it accentuated it. And to your point, if we could use that to accentuate what we're doing, I mean, gosh, if we use it properly, it could only, it, it could only improve us. Lance, there's did you have a, your hand up? I'm sorry, oh, sorry there's one, one, one last thing. There's a philosopher named Ken Wilbur who has spent a lot of time in uh, studying the philosophy. He, he says by, night, uh, by the year 2050, all of our, all of us, uh, our human humanity will be subject to AI and controlled by AI. But anyway, that's speculative. Hopefully not controlled, but yes. Thank you. Lance, did you have your hand up? The cynic in me would say that uh, you, we already are at that level and beyond, but that's <laughs> just my cynicism. Um, it's, it's, it's an aside and, and <laughs> Ironically, probably minor compared to some of the scope of the issues that we're that we're dealing with and talking about here. But uh, Mike, when you first brought up the issue, uh, I believe it was Mike. It might have been Dan uh, that brought up the issue of uh, case uh, presentation uh, on a group. I guess it was Mike, and and having responses to that case uh, with some advice from from others who are right. on that panel, whatever their level of reliability or expertise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned when that's presented, what about confidentiality disclosures, information privacy protection for those patients? Because we've had those issues pop up in dental schools already uh, when students are attempting to share information even with other students on student groups, but it goes beyond that and suddenly the vulnerability goes skyrocketing and the school gets more than a little nervous. Let me address that really quick. And Richard posed the question before everybody else here got on. As far as I understand, so every one of these groups is a closed group. There is no way from anybody outside of the profession, everybody in there is a, is a professional. Um, you have to go through a series of questions to be admitted into these groups. And as far as I understand, and what they've looked into is, as long as you're in the, with, within these closed groups, only speaking with doctors that it has, that it has followed HIPAA guidelines. Um, now, if so, I, I've never seen that challenged. Uh, and, and maybe it will be one day, but as far as I understand it, it follows, it, it's allowed because they're closed and only with professionals. Dan, maybe you know more yeah. than that. So, I mean, it, it's super gray. I mean, there's no way to yeah. make this, this uh, a black and white answer. Um, I will tell you that a lot of people just say, as long as, you know, the face and eyes are not part of it and you're just looking at you know, teeth or mouths or things that like can't be identified as an individual uh, without their dental record, um, that it's okay. Um, what a lot of people are moving to now is like, I'll be honest, every single one of my patients signs a complete disclosure or has the opportunity 
to sign a disclosure. Now they do not have to say it's okay for me to use their cases for education, publications, uh, social media, et cetera, but a great majority do sign it. Now I still follow the same thing. I do not put faces on uh, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now I, I work with tons of plastic surgeons with what I do and uh, the plastic surgery community has had horrific issues with HIPAA compliance with their surgeons because it's they're working on faces, they're working on other parts of the body, and they're putting it all over every social media in order to get patients. They actually, it has gotten bad enough, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons has come up with their own police system to look and I mean, it, they have come up with an own like kind of like standard of how to use social media as a plastic surgeon. And it is the position of their specialty organization. And that's how they've dealt with it. And they will threaten your membership. They will threaten a whole bunch of different things. And in plastic surgery, it's a really big deal to be an ASPS member and to say you are board certified. And the two go hand in hand. Same thing with oral maxillofacial surgery. Board certification is a huge deal, 95% of or more i think of oral surgeons are board certified and so anything that would ever ju jeopardize that for me which in the canons of ethics that is part of my board certification uh, i think social media and hipaa compliance is part of that so it's definitely a huge deal people justify it in gray and uh leadership and organized dentistry and organized medicine are taking note and creating standards before their uh, specialties get under the gun legally. Thanks, Dan. And we do the same in our office. Everybody signs that I use, they, they sign a waiver as well, or it's part of their informed consent. Um, as we get to the end of this, so this is, we, I feel like the last hour and a half has flown by for me. This discussion has been robust and, and I, I feel wonderful. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn to Donna and to Dan. Um, any final thoughts, anything that's been on your mind um, before, before we close and then, uh, then any comments or qu final questions from the group? Donna first, if that's okay. Uh, yes, uh, simply you had a question about the role of uh, organized dentistry such as you know, ADA and CDA. Uh, certainly one of their roles to exist would be to provide a, a, a forum, a fora for, dentists to be able to communicate with each other. I'm assuming, you know, the IT uh, developments move too fast for these things uh, such as you're describing with Facebook to ever be done within the ADA. So that won't happen. But I, I think they should uh, support it. And uh, I also think uh, if you could ever have a communication, for instance, uh, if you had evidence that an, uh, an approach, a technique was recommended in a group and it didn't work, you all, re you all realize that, that you could uh, inform the a a ADA so they could make sure the public knows about this. And so we, we, don't, have, um, we don't have misinformation and, and even disinformation uh, as, as a threat uh, to harm the general population. And you could have a little relationship with that, maybe, because everything flows uh, from them, you know, doing the standard of care and the board of dental examiners, they do uh, an occupational uh, study, I think, every 10 years. So they find out what's being done in offices, which might not be the best treatment or the best uh, of, of a treatment plan or anything. It might not be, but that's what's done there. So they're going to fashion their tests on that. So you almost get boxed in. It's not really a box. It's, it's like a, a circle uh, yeah, in which you're not going to make progress. And you might make, uh, you have to make the case with these groups that your, your chances of making uh, progress for the world is, is better because you have more people, more ideas floating around, more uh, energy there, more thought provoking things uh, uh, in a more usable manner than uh, the old ways of simply uh, uh, in journals. So I, I, I think there's more advantages than disadvantages. Wonderful, thank you. 
Damn. Yeah, and just to, and just to kind of close it, my thoughts, I just want to thank everybody. I, I loved uh, this discussion, and although I'm quote unquote part of the panel presenting, I feel like I was just as much part of uh, a participant in learning from everybody on the call at the same time, which I think is the best uh, CE or education you can have. Um, so I really have two two things. So we're all leaders on this call. Uh, we all have influence. Um, as those leaders. So what are the two things we can do, uh, you know, after a discussion like this? I think one is we have to uh, double down and invest on standard of care uh, and our professional associations and the importance of it and communicate it with our specialty groups, the ADA and other, you know, uh, key influencers, uh, not on social media, but the influencers of, of our profession. Um, and we cannot lose hold of those standards. The second thing is going back to dental students and young professionals, instead of talking about evidence-based dentistry from a literature review perspective and what you're gonna do, we need to start teaching dental students with a, with a screenshot of an Instagram post and start critical thinking in that way. We need to stop talking about lit reviews and we need to start talking about what they're actually using and what they're using is Instagram and Facebook and other things. And then to going back to Mike's opening statement, show them a slide, have the discussion, and then say, okay, if you want to fact check them, where would you go? What would you look up? Mm -hmm. What would you do? And now you're creating a critical thinking person in the context of a 21st century social media mm -hmm. environment. So that's kind of my call to the educators here is going back to the dental schools and, and evaluating what's being done. And I'm actually gonna send Dr. Nader Shahi at Pacific an email right after this, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, because I'm gonna find out how it's being taught at Pacific and maybe I can zoom in and be part of the new education curriculum uh, for that. So those are kind of my final thoughts. And just thank you for everybody for sharing so, so many amazing, uh, incredible insights tonight. Thank you, Dan. Lance. Dan, that's uh, uh, really a very, very good insight. And um, it, it occurs that it would be very helpful for the American College and, and, and uh, any other organization that was uh, interested in doing so to, to do uh, just what you've mapped out, but to include some of the extremely popular uh, uh, high user sites as examples with some of the offshoots that, that you know are just preposterous and, and would not stand up to even the most basic tests. And similarly, some of the very small sites that have produced so that people could begin to dissociate popularity from reliability. Uh, will that happen? Maybe I'm dreaming, but, but I would like to think that we could certainly include that message uh, in the very important literature that, that is made available and the teaching. And if those sorts of, of <laughs> templates are prepared and made available to dental schools, I think they would use them. I think there would be people in the schools who know that the concerns there, but really don't have the time or the opportunity because it's publish or perish out there. They want help, direction, uh, if they're provided a template that they can customize, they can at least get those points across to the critical groups of dental students that are all out there. And I must say, just as in my closing, that this is probably one of the most intriguing and productive discussions that I, in which I've participated. And I, and, I, and I thank everyone for this. My brain's full now, uh, but uh, I would certainly want to continue these discussions <laughs> and I certainly hope we shall. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Thanks there are that. And, and the only thing I'm, uh, that I'd like to add. Mike, go ahead. Uh, sorry, last piece for me. The only thing I wanted to add to what everybody said is moving forward, I also think we need to partner with these groups. Let's just make sure that it's not a contentious relationship as we move forward. If we partner with them, I think the sky's the limit. I think they're looking for leadership and we're the leaders that they need, you know, and, and, and everybody on this call, I think has a role in that. So again, thank you for allowing me to moderate this and be a part of this. It, it's been wonderful. Richard, over to you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank our three presenters, uh, Mike, Dan, and Donna for taking their time on a, on a Friday evening to 
to meet with us and share their thoughts. And uh, I, I see my fellow editor, Dan Orr, is on the call here, and I think you'll agree with me. Uh, uh, um, editors and publishers are always looking for the right medium or media to communicate with other 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 dentists. And I think that's sort of kind of their, the holy grail of uh, dental communication. The problem is they keep moving goalposts. So, uh, but again, I'd like to thank our uh, uh, three doctors, uh, Hammer, uh, Maru, and Horowitz for, for sharing with us tonight. And also I'd like to thank Susan Pittman and the ACD office staff for all their help. Uh, without them, this would not have been possible. Uh, if you need CE credit, um, uh, Susan Pittman can supply that information, and uh, uh, I believe we we're offering two hours. And uh, uh, if if you can either contact me or her, and we'll get you that information for your CE. Uh, before we sign off, did we have any questions? If not, I'll wish everyone a good evening and a good weekend, and thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you Look very much. To seeing thank you all again. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, all.